So thank you once again, everyone, for joining. So this is uh, Sanjay Shrivastava. I'm I'm the CEO of Bookerium, and with me I have uh, Professor Yao Fran from uh, UC um, San Diego. And today the I will start with a five minute introduction about Bookerium, and then I'll uh, hand it to you all, and uh, we'll have Q and A after that. And uh, please go ahead and type your questions in the chat or um, wait till the end of the presentation. For those of you who don't know about Vocarium, we are in the business of providing virtual labs. Um, and when we say virtual lab, these are compute spaces with uh, content and with policies uh, that are set by the instructor, which can determine how long the labs are open, for example, how much budget can be spent and things like that. And uh, uh, Vocarium is used in a wide range of subject areas today, uh, data science, programming, engineering, uh, big data, machine learning. Cloud computing is a pretty big deal for us because we have a pretty substantial relationship with uh, AWS, which means we have a few hundred thousand learners uh, learning cloud computing in Vocarium. And then databases, a um, lot of full stack and DevOps and cybersecurity classes. Uh, just a really quick uh, slide about Vocarium. How are we different? You can find uh, tools out there which might be take care of programming or maybe VDIs, but we like to think we have the broadest portfolio of fully managed labs. Uh, we have a fair amount of assessment options that we have built over time, like auto grading, competitions, manual grading, mastery learning, and things like that. We do uh, recognize that our labs do not exist in isolation, which means um, uh, they are meant to be integrated into, into an LMS by LTI or there is a REST API for custom integration. There's a large number of uh, certification collaboration options available and these things do work at scale. So right now, for example, we have about 600,000 active users and, uh, they are in, um, uh, and they are active in about 700 or so uh, institutions. Fair amount in the US, but then we are beginning to have a broader and broader international presence now. These labs are used in different contexts like MOOCs, performance based exams, boot camps, uh, hackathons, in research, in content syndication, uh, where you might want to syndicate labs with your content, and then for virtual campus labs. So that was a really quick overview about Vocarium. Uh, of course, uh, if you want to learn more, please reach out to us. But I will, at this point, hand it to you off for talk about um, his experience with machine learning teaching. So um, when I describe uh, to people what is data science, um, and uh, I put it very much in the context of, uh, of professional uh, work. Um, what what do people do with data science? So uh, I compare uh, traditional analytics that is done in uh, in in business intelligence uh, in businesses to the more modern data science. So in the traditional approach, you basically collect all of the data into a big data warehouse. And um, that lives on one side uh, of the company. And then you have people that do business analytics um, and that lives on a separate side. And then there is some, basically the, the information technology is seen as nothing but providing the data to the analytics person um, so, that they can, so that they can draw their conclusion. Uh, the problem, of course, is that there is a big boundary between these two. Um, so um, it's, it's not at all easy for the business analytics to direct what data is collected um, or for the information technology people to basically supply the most relevant information. So now um, in more modern days, we move to analytics in a distributed approach. And what we have is basically in each shop, in each location of this organization, we have its own compute power. And then we basically collect data um, and, uh, and we put it on machines on the cloud. 
And then we have a whole array of tools to work with this data. So um, the, the uh, people that work on this um, need to have a variety of uh, capabilities. Um, and um, I usually divide them into two, two types of analysts. One is the methods experts that, that is expert in machine learning and, um, and in data analysis and uh, big data. And the other is the domain expert that has expertise in the particular domain that, uh, that you want to do the analysis in. So I'll skip that. Um, so basically when you talk about education of a data scientist, um, uh, I took this from, from a book about doing data science. Um, you can draw this um, Venn diagram um, of three types of knowledge that go into the data science. One is uh, math and statistics knowledge that uh, goes into it. The other is hacking skills or programming skills, if you will. And the third is the substantive expertise, what I call the domain knowledge. And you really need all three of them in order to be effective as a, as a data scientist. Um, if you just live in within one area, then um, you, you, can't really, you can't really affect the, the progress of the data analysis. So that brings me to what uh, called uh, literate computing. So in 1992, uh, Donald Knuth um, generated, I mean, coined this term literate programming that says that programs should be easy to read. They shouldn't just do the things that they were plan that, that they were designed to do, but somebody should be able to come in and analyze them. And uh, Fernando Perez, much more recently, coined a term based on that called literate computing. So it's not just the programming that, that should be readable, but it's also the way the program is used on the data. Okay, so to me, this is one of the central things in, in, in data science to appreciate uh, literate computing because one of the biggest uh, hurdles to, to doing effective work is communication and uh, literate computing helps you with that. So Fernando Perez is one of the people that developed Jupyter notebooks or uh, IPy Python notebooks at that time. And um, that is what we use as a basis for, for, for our work. So here I'm just saying the, the first class that that is taught in a sequence of four, um, where you basically work, learn the basic tools um, of computation on data using uh, Jupyter notebooks. And uh, okay, I'll skip these different things that you learn, but basically it's a, it's a big array of different things. And okay, I'll skip that. So, now that we arrived in, in Jupyter Notebooks, um, we have been using them across the board in, in different um, setups in, in uh, courses inside UCSD, graduate courses, um, now undergraduate courses, and also teaching them in the MAS DSE, which is the continuing education and then teaching them in, uh, through edX MicroMaster, which is uh, where uh, we, most, we have the highest reliance on uh, Vocarium to basically deliver the notebooks and test the notebooks using uh, NVGrader and so on. So do I have another five minutes? No, you, you have um, as much time, uh as you want you are. so we are still pretty early into the okay to the presentation so okay. i said give you 30 minutes so okay perfect okay. all right so what i want to do now is i want to show you just as an example maybe the 
first notebook that, that, that I present to the students and how it basically implements this idea of uh, uh, literate computing. So, I'll do stop share. Take me a minute. So by the way, all of these notebooks are publicly available, so you're welcome. I can give you the pointer to how to get to them. Um, All right, so uh, for those of you uh, that are, that know Jupyter, you see it's a, it works through a web interface. And uh, here I'm going to go to this subdirectory notebook, and then I'm going to go to uh, pregnancy length analysis. Okay. Oh, sorry. This is this is not the mode I wanted. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so, so this is a notebook. I'm not going to describe uh, more than that. Just to point out that one of the very convenient things about notebooks is that it's multi-use. So you can use it. Uh, the student can basically download it and use it by themselves to to run the to run the different cells. Um, you can have inside it. Uh, tests or query questions that 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 are then later uh, tested internally using something called NB Grader, and you can use it for presentation. So let me go to the presentation mode. Okay, so this is. This is the presentation mode. I don't know why the first is not working. Um, just a second. Oh, as usual, I didn't test this before, so it's not working. So basically, the presentation mode um, is, is a mode in which you can go through some of the cells and you see them um, as a presentation. 
and um, um, basically that that is a very useful way to use them inside the class but because it's not really working right now i'll just go the regular mode and so so what does uh being what does being um uh, literate computing mean to me at least is that i start by actually getting describing exactly where i got the data from what is the data about um, and um, the and the basic question which is are firstborn babies more likely to arrive late okay so there's there's a question that we're asking about the real world not not about the data but the real world and we want to answer it based on the data so so we load the data and then describe more about its format and the different parts and parse it put it into a data frame and then we need to clean it and as all real data is there is there is significant cleaning to to be done so for instance here when we look at the weight of the baby we see the histogram shows us that there is most of the babies have weight below around you know below 10 pounds but there are some babies that weigh something like 99 pounds and so we look at those specifically and we realize um, those probably are data set points that we should remove okay then there are some data points that are between 99 and 20 and we look at them here and um, we're not sure really about them uh, but they still seem to be safer to remove because we have so much data that we'd rather not have these outliers. And so this is exactly the point where the students say, well, how do you know which ones to remove? And I basically say, you don't know in general which one to remove. It's partially science, partially art. And that's exactly the place where you definitely need the domain scientist that would tell you whether this is at all possible or 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 is it is it is it just one field that is maybe wrong okay once we remove all of those now we have a nice semi gaussian distribution of the weights of the babies and so we're satisfied that this is at least in terms of the weight it's cleaned up then we look at other fields and we see that there are many records that are, there are fields that are missing. Uh, so that for the same record, there would be, um, let's say six feet, six of the fields are missing, 352. And so we're like, what is that? And when we look, we realize, okay, those are, those are not good pregnancies. These are not babies that were actually born. It's various uh stillbirth miscarriage and so on okay so the live births are the these um th these ones that, that don't have so many things missing and then we remove those and then finally we start to analyze the data um, and we see that um, there are different ways of plotting the of plotting the relationship between the length of the pregnancy and the birth order and you see here a scatter plot that doesn't seem to say very much, especially because the scatter plot for firstborn, secondborn, the points fall on top of each other. So it's very hard to judge what's the actual distribution. So we can do something better with box plots and see that the mean changes very little. And then we can draw two histograms, one for the babies that are what? Uh, what is it? Uh, the babies with with the that that are born early and the babies that are no no sorry the firstborn sorry the firstborn versus everything the blue and so these might look a little bit different but they're not very different so the way that we make this into a clear statement is we uh use a statistical test and the statistical test tells us that that uh, they are not different or the probability the p-value that they're different is 
0.41, which is very high, basically meaning that we can't reject the null hypothesis that they are the same. Okay, so at the end of the day is what did we learn, right? So the most important thing to realize is we did not learn anything about the question that we asked, right? Which is kind of disappointing, but I think that this disappointment should come early so that the students are used to it because in most cases, when you do statistical analysis, whether you use, um, whether you use uh, machine learning or neural networks or, or, or logistic regression or just comparing means, uh, in many cases, the results that you get are not statistically significant, meaning that they can't really generalize well to, to new data. Um, so, so in that regard, we didn't learn anything, but we learned, of course, some of the technique, techniques. So that's what I call, uh, uh, from, uh, this, is, this is my, my, in a way, my best um, um, literary computing um, notebook, because I combine computing and explanation and statistics um, all together in one, uh, in one setting. And uh, when we um, do it in the MAS DSE, sorry, in the, in the um, mic edX MicroMasters, uh, the backing of that is, is um, Vocarium. And by now we ran the courses enough times that things are pretty smooth and they run, they essentially these courses run more or less uh, with, with minimal attendance. Um, so, Okay, so I hope that was helpful and uh, happy to answer any questions.